Our research is focused on HIV cure. We're trying to find ways in which we might be able to eradicate the virus from the body. And for that, we've taken advantage of a model that we developed a few years back called the Palmaro liver thymus, or BLT mice. And those are very special animals in the sense that they recapitulate very key aspects of HIV infection, including latency. And so it provides us with an in vivo model where we can actually test a variety of novel approaches before they can be implemented in the clinic. We can take a lot of risks that you can't take with a patient. Right, so how important is it um, to be able to do work in animals before you go to humans? It's of fundamental importance to do experiments in animals before you do in humans. The proof of principle that you need in order to be able to translate into clinical application is one of the fundamental aspects of the scientific enterprise. We can um, perform experiments much faster, we can ask questions deeper, we can perform analysis that would be impossible to do in a human being. So in that sense, I think animal experimentation in this particular context is extremely well ethically justified. Um, can you give us an example of something you can do in your mice that can't be done in humans? Okay, one of the most important questions currently is where are the HIV infected cells that represent the reservoir that is responsible for the uh, continuous presence of the virus despite extended, extended years in therapy. We don't know where they are. We can't go and look in the liver of an infected individual. We can't go and look in the thymus or the spleen or in the lymph nodes. But in the mice, we can't. Mm -hmm. We can go and dissect exactly where they are, how many are present, where they last longer, uh, and then if we have a way to eradicate them, we can actually count how many cells get killed in each specific tissue. So for example, people are very concerned about the brain. The brain is a reservoir of HIV, but it would be impossible to go and do an, any type of experiment that asks how many latently infected cells are in the brain of a human being. Well, that is the type of experiment that is extremely sophisticated, is extremely expensive, is virtually impossible to do in any other system except perhaps no human primates and humanized mice. And I think that it challenged us to come up with experiments that were impossible before, that you wouldn't even think of because they would be perceived to be um, just not feasible, but now we can do them, and, uh, and I think the information is forthcoming. Great. So, um, what are the biggest challenges you face with your work? The, the main challenge that we face with our work is to keep thinking out of the box, to keep um, the preconceived notions that we have influence what we do next, to, to, to try to really let go of, of, uh, of um, what we perceive to be the truth to actually find out what exactly the truth is. And when, when we face that, we not only face it ourselves in our own daily life, but we actually face it with the people that are judging what we do. Particularly people who fund the work that we do in the sense that they, they get an aggressive proposal that, that, that is looking at, at um, uh, parts of, of the anatomy or, or parts of the science that have not been probed before. And it's sometimes difficult for people to make that leap of faith that we will be able to find something, or more importantly, that is worth their money to let us take the risk. And I think that we need innovation. I think we need an opportunity to go where nobody's been there before. And, um, and I think that a lot of people would, be, uh, would have a very difficult time letting us uh, do that. And, and I speak for many, not just ourselves. Well, you raised funders. Um, what, what role has AMFAR played in your career, in your research? AMFAR is the reason I'm talking to you today. When I was a postdoctoral fellow in the, at the Fred Hutchinson's Cancer Research Institute, I started to do my independent work. And if it had not been for the seed grant for AMFAR, we would not be here today. I, I, I mean, this has gone, gone back from I mean, almost 25 years ago. And uh, since then, AMVAR is, is played an integral role in everything we do. Now, not me receiving the funds, but the people who train under my tutelage that are actually are benefiting from having the opportunity to, to do their work because AMVAR is taking a chance on, on, on them.